Hi. How are you guys doing? Fine, thanks. Good. Hi, Greg hi. Peterson. Yeah, hi, Greg. Good to see you again. Todd Singleton. Yeah, hi, Todd. Good to meet you. you Just doing? giving myself a little this will work test. Out okay. This will work fine. Okay. Good. They have a little studio set up. Yeah. Yeah. Looks official. Just the backdrop yeah. you desire. Isn't this is perfect. Yeah. All right. Great. So there's some chairs around here and chairs over there. There's a little footstool you could sit over there look okay. on the couch too you, ever been down the couch? you and greg have a lot in common a lot of um intersecting interests overlapping interests yeah now do you remember in the baptism do i have to change my shoes no you will not have to you're, you'll never see your shoes dad okay. in the baptism where where there's pictures of baptism in there uh what do we do with those but anyway do you remember whose baptism it was? Yeah. Michael's? Mine? James? You hid it in the books. Well, that one was Michael's. No, it's a picture, Mr. Regis. Yeah. The My, video the picture was of Michael. Michael. Right. I think that's probably it. <laughs> this one here. Uh, where's my glasses? Oh. I knew we could. There, try these. I don't know if they work. <laughs> you want to try these? That looks like George Raptors to me. Right, this is George Raptors. And Mom. And. Is there a Lucas there? Not in this one. Mm -hmm. So my reaction would be. Uh, you don't know. This could be Ellen's. This cute. is Father Jeremy Ellis? That's what Liz thinks. Huh? Yeah, we think yeah. so. Yeah, that's we, Father All Jerry. the baptisms were in Jamestown, weren't they? No, uh -huh. you were baptized in the Orthodox of the Cathedral of New York City. Yeah. Okay. Boom. That's what yeah. your pictures were. Yours and um, um, Mike's were for, at the Cathedral. Is this the Episcopal Church Church uh, in Olean? Wellsville. Wellsville? All right, Wellsville. I'm trying to think of. Um, that's where it would have been if it was. I it think was this was the cathedral too. That might have been the cathedral. So it might be. It's a pretty grand looking. It is the is the Saint Nicholas Church. No. So that's out. Um, okay. It's not the Episcopal right. not Church important. in Wellsville, and it's not. And, the, and they didn't have services in only in that we attended. Well, Mr. Raptus and all those, Irene. That's right. This, it looks to me like this is, is that Irene Raptus? Oh, Mentis? <laughs> you do. Yeah, let me. I am. Oh, you one. got your own glasses. Yeah, I think so, yes. Yes. So I was yeah. baptizing, I was godfather to um, Irene's children. You think it could and be they that? Were, and mm -hmm. that service occurred. That, that makes Saint more Nicholas sense because he's holding the baby. Yeah. That true. makes more sense. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mr. Regis, thank you. This is great. We're delighted to be here. And we are doing a project on the upcoming 100th anniversary of St. Nick's Church, St. Nicholas's Orthodox Church, and you were part of that, such a part of that. I'm just curious, uh, your mom and dad were immigrants from Greece. Whereabouts did, were they, did they grow up, your mom and dad? Yes, the question. Again. Yeah, your dad, James, Yes. Where, were, where was he born and where did he grow up in Greece? He grew up in Arachova in Greece, in the central part of the country. Small little community of 2,000 people. 
the elevation of the mountain was about 3,300 people. And uh, mom grew up in the same village. Mm -hmm. And if I can take a minute please, to uh, tell you a story that my dad came to the uh, United States in 1912 and did the usual things of uh, uh, early immigrants, worked on the railroads, and, and then eventually ended up in Johnsonburg, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, working in a paper mill unloading uh, the um, logs from the railroad and eventually uh, he wanted to do something on his own and uh, he and another uh, Greek immigrant opened up a flat uh, hat blocking facility in Olean <coughs> and they block the hats and then they shine shoes and in the back they had a pool hall so and they were right in at the end of the trolley car and they did very very well uh, their name was Poolis the partners they lost their their um, What am I looking for? The uh, the lease. The, the lease. So they looked for a place, and they eventually ended up in Wellsville, and they opened up a hat blacking plant in Wellsville, and Pool Hall. And a uh, long and short of it, eventually, one of their customers talked my dad in opening up a Texas hot, and that was begun in 1921. Now, getting back to my story, my dad, when he opened up the store in 1921, there was a, just before that, there was a change in the immigration rules that where they welcome people from Mediterranean area, the Spanish and Italians and the Greeks, and they became a, a tightening of the rules. And all the Greek young men that were in this country decided, well, if they wanted to marry a Greek girl, they had to get them over before the rule changed. So my dad was one of them, and he wrote back to the village to his brother and he said, would you please recommend somebody from the village that might make a wonderful wife and mother? And they uh, wrote back and they said, Eleni Brazis would, would be a wonderful lady. So my dad wrote a letter to the Brazis family asking for her hand and after much consul consultations between the two families, my mother on her own made the decision, she was 21, that there would be a better life in America. And she heard good things about my dad in this country, as well as back around in Greece. So my mother came to this country sight unseen, greeted in New York City by my dad. They rode the train together and up over the Texas hot, they were married by Father Janides. Uh, okay. And then in 1924, November, of, November 15th of 1924, a guy named John Regis is born. I was born over the restaurant in that apartment that they were married. Okay. And you, so you're going to be turning 95. You look great. You well, look great. Well, thank you. I, uh, 
I've been pretty lucky in many ways. Bless. So as you're growing up in the Wellsville area, what was the, tr were there any Greeks in the Wellsville area? Was there, was that a population there? Sure. There was about five Greek families. Um, I can name them. The Joplas family, the Criticos family, the Rigas family, the Raptors family, and the Xanthus family, and the Toporus family. And all together, we had about 30 children. And uh, they all had confectionery stores. One was named the Aster, the other was named Criticos. We had the restaurants, the Texas Hot, the Marathon Restaurant, the Star Restaurant, and that was our little Greek community. And we were all born pretty much on Main Street. So my playground and all of us were on Main Street. We lived in the apartments over our place of business. And uh, we had a wonderful playground. We had all those alleys. <laughs> the river was nearby. The city hall was a nice three-story building. And policemen and everybody let us play in it get out of the cold, so that was, a, that was the environment. But the important thing is that I think that might be of interest is that my mother decided that the children should have a little bit of some Greek background or learn how to speak Greek and write. So she wrote to the paper in New York, the Greek paper, Kittyus, and asked, uh, and put an ad in looking for a teacher. And as a result, we, Mrs. Xanthus, who became our Greek teacher, came to Wellsville, and along with her husband and two children, Peter and Georgia, and they started a Greek school. Mm. And we had to go to Greek school uh, right after the American class was over at 3.30, had to go to Greek school. And on Saturday morning, we would go from 9 to 12. And we were a disaster. <laughs> because we certainly, the older boys gave Mrs. Xanthus a hard time. Mm -hmm. So as a consequence, became a process of how are we going to discipline these guys. So it's interesting to me, it's kind of funny. So they began, the first thing they did is, well, we'll go down by the river and we'll get some will to whips. So they made sure that every morning, Mrs. Xanthus had about 10 or 15 willow whips on her desk, all lined up. <laughs> and of course, when we were paying attention, and uh, we um, were undisciplined, Mrs. Xanthus would reach out and give us a, a crack on our hands. And, um, so that was instant number one. And the result, the older boys began to become more ruly because when she reached out to, to hit her with a whip, they would reach out and grab it and take it away from her because they were 15, 16 year old boy. And then they'd laugh about it and poor Mrs. Xanthus, you know, couldn't handle it. So the next step was, well, the parents said, we'll, we'll attend there. And uh, every, at all the classes, there would all be two parents, adults, to watch us all and make sure that we behave. And 
Then the parents got, they couldn't live up. They had their jobs, they were working their long hours. It was kind of hard, it was a sad. So they decided if they got a good report, this, us students got a good report from the teachers, they'd pay us 25 cents every week as a bribe. And then the older guys, and I was one of them that's getting there, would run across the street and put it in the slot machine and, and spend it all at one time. <laughs> so then the quarter worked for a few months, but it didn't last. And then so happened Mrs. Macris owned the Temple Theater. And movies in those days were very precious. And, uh, and her big attractions in that time was uh, Shirley Temple and Will Rogers. I don't know how many people remember Will Rogers, but people would really line up to see those two movies. And then she had the usual cowboys, Ken Manier, Tom Mix, and then later on Ken Buck Jones, and later on came the singing cowboys, Roy Rogers, and Gene Autry, and it's such a, which became very popular. So, and Mrs. Macris was generous and kind enough, and she decided to, um, she would allow us in the movies for free if we got a good report from the teachers. And that worked very effective because Movies were precious in those days. It wasn't television, obviously, the radio. So um, that's a sideline that uh, was our Greek community. And the Greek community in Wellsville um, became very, very active all through high school. All of them did very well, made the honor rolls made the varsity teams in all the sports. Uh, uh, and we learned a little bit of Greek and writing and grammar, grammatiki, <laughs> and uh, so on. Did you also have religious education there too, as far as just the Greek Orthodox Christian religion? Was that part of your teaching? Sure, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, and, um, and since the closest Orthodox Church was Jamestown, which we were a part of, and then next was Buffalo, but the priest from Jamestown would serve our community and come on uh, special holidays uh, for fasting periods. And uh, one of the things that I remember very well was every year they would come around to bless the homes. And that was usually sometime in January. And I particularly remember because uh, uh, taking Father Rafi, uh, Father, um, what am I thinking? Genethis. What's a fa Father Genethis? Father Genethis and the Daskalo around from house to house. And if we didn't walk, or have a car, we walked all around. East side, west side, south side. Took a, three or four hours. Usually it was cold in January and February, and it was a long hike. And they stuck it out, and uh, I had the uh, pleasure, in many ways as I look back on it, it was honored to escort them to all the homes and watch the Greek people greet them, kiss their hand as he came in the house, make sure that everything was proper order to have the Greco and everything, and then take the sacraments and, and bless the house. 
And that was a, and we did that from practically every one of the priests at St. Nicholas. Yeah. Did you but have later on? We had cars. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> when you had cars, did you go to Jamestown much? From Wellsville, did you go to church service there? I think we went to Jamestown on the average of two or three times a year. Mm -hmm. We try to make the service on Good Friday. Uh, it was a hard service. Uh, of course, we fast Mondays and Wednesdays, and fasting was kind of hard, I thought, uh, as a young man. Uh, I loved milk, and I couldn't drink milk. And uh, so I, um, but we'd always go there on holidays and some other days. And there was usually a picnic uh, that we might attend, uh, you know, yeah. But I'd say on the average, probably we'd go two or three times a year. <coughs> Did they have the old church then? Yes, they <coughs> had the old church. Uh, that was on Chapman Street. Yes. And what do you remember about the old ch the old church? If you closed your eyes and had to kind of describe it, what would you say? Well, I think the first thing I remember was, um, and I forgot what you call them, but maybe you can <laughs> help me, is uh, where the men, the older men, sat or standing, the, the Creek Church. A great part of it was standing, and the older people get tired, and they had these little stands on the sides of the church where the older men could stand up and lean on them uh, and rest. That's one thing I remembered, as uh, I was surprised. Uh, uh, the other thing I remember, how simple the church was. It wasn't anything elaborate, uh, it was uh, just a typical Greek church with not much gold or ornament or anything at the beginning as a kid. But the icons, the, the, the icons and icons and all their images there in front was one I remember very well. And then when the priest would open up the door, I thought it was very effective. And, but I remember uh, how it was to come into the church for the first time and, and light a candle. And that's always stayed with me, lighting that candle and kissing the icon. And so that was the beginning of things that I would remember from the church. Now, a little bit about your family. You had your mom, your dad. Did you have any siblings? Were there any brothers or sisters? I had uh, two sisters and a brother, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you all would go? We Greek? all crowd into my dad's 1934 Rio, <laughs> which was, I, um, as a nostalgia, I have an old Rio. Ah. I, uh, one of my antique cars, and uh, when I frost first bought it back, I was surprised how small and and crowded it was. I don't know how we all got into <laughs> it. And, oh, you know, uh, we did. Yes. So uh, my brothers and sisters, we all um, I went to the church in Jamestown and sometimes once a year or twice we might go to Buffalo to the service. Would you go to services in Wellsville? Did you have a relationship with uh, the Episcopal Church or anything like that? Yeah, we certainly did. I think the, all of the Greek children became a big part of the Episcopal Church. Every Sunday you could depend on all of us being there without fail. And uh, the, the priest was Father Petros and took a special interest in uh, our uh, education and uh, 
he had a special interest in uh, teaching the Greek words that uh, were used in the Bible and liturgy and this, how they related. I remember that. And later on, um, uh, Father Petros, uh, in order to get a good start in Latin, we all took Latin, uh, he uh, gave us less than Latin. So we were having La Greek lessons, English Latins lessons, and Latin lessons. So we, wow. Uh, the, so the, but the Episcopal Church was a big, big part in our early beginning in this small town, no question about it. And we, and we owe a lot to, the, to that. But uh, at, at the end of the day, uh, we, um, when we grew older and got married, we all went back to the, uh, the Greek Orthodox Church. And as the, uh, so the, really, the closest Greek Orthodox Church from when you were growing up and then when you got married and had children was still Jamestown. Correct. And most of my children were going to the Episcopal Church like we did every Sunday, and, but they were baptized and uh, married in, uh, in the Orthodox Church, and uh, my wife, uh, not being Greek, uh, made the conversion and was baptized in the Orthodox Church. So your wife was not Greek. What was she? Her, her background was Danish. Mm -hmm. And she grew up in Penyan and became a teacher. Okay. Okay. So we're probably related because I'm Scandinavian. Oh, so, you? Yeah, so there's a lot more going on here, John. Okay, very good. <laughs> well, you'll be good to me then. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so she converted to the Greek. And do you remember some stories of the parishioners up in Jamestown, maybe some of the fathers of the priests. Uh, do you remember some incident, something that you can recall that has a, a memory of yours? Um, I guess the biggest memory that I had, uh, and it was an honor, when Father Bacalis was our priest in Jamestown, and he was a big basketball fan. He played basketball for the University of Virginia. And uh, as a consequence, he um, organized a basketball team of the Orthodox boys, and they competed. They competed in the league in Jamestown. And on this particular year, they decided to um, go to the national tournament, and it was held in Peabody, Massachusetts, for the Orthodox churches and compete. So we organized the team. There was, I forget you would know them better. Who were the the Cummings and the, some of the other stars there? And they were pretty good basketball players, and uh, a lot of fun. And my son James made the team, and when we were scheduled to go to the tournament in Peabody, Massachusetts, Father Nick called me up and said, John, I can't go. Will you take the team to Peabody? And I said, "Well, sure." And he says, "You're gonna, you, you be the coach." <laughs> and so I got up there, and uh, uh, we got in a tournament, and they were full of it because we checked in the hotel. And, 
they uh, spill. We were up on the second or third or third floor, and she they'd spill water on pedestrians walking by. I had hard trouble controlling them sometimes. They were full of it, and they were having a great time. And uh, um, I can't e express a word in this interview, but you get the idea <laughs> that one day we were all sitting in this f fancy restaurant having dinner, dinner at night, and on a speaker came calling Mr. Whatchamacall, which wasn't a very nice word. <laughs> we kept going over the speaker. <laughs> of course, there wasn't anybody, but when I heard it, I panicked. <laughs> so I had to find them <laughs> where they were. And they thought that was hilarious. You know? <laughs> but then that's just what it is that I remember. It was a great, it was a great trip. We had a lot of fun. And by the way, we won their tournament. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that's a great story. Now, what about some of the the fathers? You talked about Father Genethis. What about Father uh, Nick? Uh, um, Raphael. 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 Yeah. Do you remember any stories about him? Father Nick, do I remember? I should remember a lot because Father Nick uh, was um, a very strong priest, very set in his ways. Uh, grew up in New York City, right next to Yankee Stadium and a big Yankee f fan. And uh, what I remember about Raphael uh, is he would attend all the free saber games he could come to. <laughs> and he would bring in as many as he could from the parish and his sons and so on, and being an enthusiastic saber fans and cheered on. And what I do remember is that I had the idea that I would like to uh, invite a uh, the Orthodox Church in New York State to a, a Sabres game. So I asked Father Raphael to organize, and he was enthusiastic. So we invited everybody from Albany, Rochester, Utica, uh, Buffalo, of course, and Jamestown, and all the youth were invited to a saber game, and Father Nick uh, organized it, and uh, we had this big congregation of young people at the game cheering for the sabers, and they had a wonderful time. And I'm sure any of them that are still around would remember that. Yeah. But Father Nick was a big supporter of that, and uh, did a great job of organizing it. Yeah. During that time when you were the owners of the Sabres, who was your favorite player? When you went to the game, and I would see you at the games a lot, who was that player on the team you'd say, man, he's good? Well, you know, that's not fair. There are, I have great memories, uh, first of all. You know, I really, when I took over the team and and just, uh, it was because they were having a hard time and desperate, and, and uh, it tied in to the cable industry because I could show their games on television and so on. That's another story. But the point is that um, with the Sabres, um, I didn't know the game. I picked up on it, and I realized a couple things. One is 
that the people that made the hockey team, the young men, most of them came from Canada, from the farms and the small towns. And they weren't the typical football player or basketball player, completely different culture. And they were great, wonderful citizens and uh, players, but had a great attitude. So you asked me which one, well, I won't pick the most popular with me because they were all, I, I have to name them. But I will tell you the one that made the big difference was Hassock. You know, I would, and Hassock was uh, uh, just an extraordinary goalie. He got us as far as the Stanley Cup Finals. And then we had that incident with no goal, which was a great experience. And, Not a pleasant one, but uh, it's one lives in my memory. So, yeah, you know, if I, um, uh, but I always like um, uh, Pekka. He had something special going for him. Again. Yeah, I'd have, and there was Brown and Revels and Hasek, yeah, I can name them. They're wonderful. Well, I can tell you, I was there with you when we played the Dallas Stars and- Oh yeah. Yeah, and uh, Mr. Brett Hall allegedly, allegedly scored a goal. You remember in the it. I was in, I watched it I, right there, in fact, I. I don't want to go through my story, but I was videotaping that, and I actually have the scene. Wow. But, yeah. We digress. Otherwise, we'll never get back to where we want to get to. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I can share your excitement, your remembrance, and your pain. All of that in one. Uh, you, at one point, the St. Nicholas Greek Orthodox Church has a fire. The old church burns down. And do you remember that at all? You know, I only remember, what year was that? Can you tell me? No, remember the early date? Early 60s, Des? Yes, the early 60s. In, in the early 60s. It's, yeah, I remember hearing about it. And uh, uh, there was, uh, my parents were very upset, obviously, and wondering what was going to happen. And I remember later on um, the priest coming to um, talk about um, uh, renovating the church and, and uh, raising some money, but uh, that's about all I can remember of any significance to me. Uh, they then would have had, of course, have built the church that we now know I today. I remember that, uh, the, the church and the plans and that and how difficult it was to decide how it should look. And there was all kinds of dis discussions about that. And I remember uh, 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 it made a real effort and a dedication from the small congregation to raise that money and build the church that they have now. Were you, I know you were part of that financially, were you also part of the planning at all, John? Did they seek your advice about the dome and the, the, the actual structure? No, <laughs> because I couldn't help them. <laughs> uh, I left that up. Father Nick would talk to me. Father, after he'd come to Wellsville, he'd come to Wellsville once a month. And that's another story. He'd come to Wellsville religiously. And he had that service. He used his St. John's Episcopal Church. And our small community would attend there. And we'd have, you know, 30, 40, and the older people anywhere. And then he... Father F. 
Ralphie always wanted to go to the Texas hot and he'd order a steak. <laughs> so, so he went to the Texas hots and ordered a steak. Yeah. I can't imagine. Yeah. So he always looked forward to this steak, God bless him. And we would talk about the plans and, uh, and then I would ask him a whole lot of history of, I learned about a lot about the Orthodox Church and the politics that was happening in there. And, uh, and he was very knowledgeable in, in all those things, very active in watching what was happening to politics and whatnot in the Orthodox Church. So getting, but he would discuss the church with me. And uh, of course, uh, we talked about uh, um, how we were going to raise the money and what I could do and what other people could do in Wellsville. The church in Jamestown consists of, right now, the St. Nicholas Greeks, Greek Orthodox Church, and then there's also an Albanian church nearby. Did Father Nick talk to you about the politics of the church at all? Why, why there's an Albanian church and why there's a Greek Orthodox church? Do you remember talking about that? I remember before Father Raphael that there wasn't the Albanian church and the uh, Albanians were attending the Orthodox church. And in fact, I remember uh, Father Gioannidis, I think came from Albania, I'm not sure, but I, that's my recollection. And um, there was some criticism. He didn't speak the Greek as well as he should. He kind of at times mumbles things through. Uh, but uh, the Zoskolo made up for him because he was very particular and very good and so on. Um, yeah, there was always discussion about the Albanians uh, were part of the service and there was a lot of Albanians in Jamestown, yeah. That was part of it. But ultimately, they sort of split. I mean, at least there's two congregations. Yes, uh, but I don't remember how that happened. I'm not close to all that. Yeah. As, as thing, you still stay very close to the St. Nicholas Greek Orthodox Church, don't you? Oh, well, of course, I. to me, uh, although I'm not, there, Sunday after Sunday, it's part of my most dearest memories because it was such a big part. The priest coming to the house, uh, mom, when the priest and the hospital who would stay at our house overnight when they blessed the homes and as a young man kissing the priest's hand, and, uh, and which was the thing to do, and uh, the association with the churches meant a lot in my growing up, and I'm sure contributed to my um, love for the Orthodox Church. It just was a big part of me, and it still is. Although I'm not there, but my heart and memories are there. Well, that's that's clear. Uh, Liz, any, any folks have any questions for John? He's on a roll. He's terrific. You're a great interview. I did? You did a fabulous job, yeah. Lexus, anything on your end? How did I do? Do I you think? I was interested to hear what you remember about the the new building and how that how that felt at that time in terms of how big of an undertaking that seemed to be. How I that was huge. That was a big, you know, the church is just a modest building. You know, it wasn't a typical. The feeling to going to Jamestown had grown up to have a, a church like that and, uh, and, and with a beautiful 
stained windows and all that. Yeah, it was a big, big thing. Made a big difference. Yeah, because growing up, you couldn't help but think that, uh, you know, um, here we are, we're Greek generations, first generations, and we're different, but the building, the old church, wasn't much to be proud of. And so now gave us this beautiful facility that we could be proud of and so on. Yeah, sure, it was a big thing. And um, Did you think it was frivolous or too ambitious? What's that? Did it seem like too big of a project financially for the group at the time? Yes, I think it did. Yes, it was a huge... Uh, and we didn't know if, if Father Nick was talking about it, whether they were going to be able to pull it off. But they did, obviously. And uh, it was a big step forward. It truly was huge. Yeah. So something we could be proud of. And uh, I'm sure... Um, that uh, enough credit can't be given to the people that uh, made their contributions and the people that were the leaders to, with a dream to accomplish your parents and so on, to accomplish what they did. Yeah, sure. And so as a consequence, I was a big benefit of it because the church is, and Nick Vickers is still my church. Yeah. I'm going to change gears here completely. Do you remember December 7th, 1941? Absolutely. What do you remember about it? December 1st, 1941. Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor. Well, I'm not proud to remember what I remembered, but I'll tell you what I remembered. It was a Sunday, and us Greek boys had a bowling team, and we were bowling Sunday in the league, and it was about one o'clock, and somebody said something about, hey, did you hear they bombed Pearl Harbor? And I didn't pay much attention. Then somebody else mentioned, well, this is serious. And uh, I didn't first grasp it. And then uh, somebody said, well, this could mean we could go to war. And then it dawned on me and then I said to somebody, well, where's Pearl Harbor? I had no idea what Pearl Harbor was about. And then, uh, you know, you, the word starts, we all start talking about it. And what I do remember after that, that night, I went to the movies. I can't tell you what was playing, but I went to the movies. But the next day, I went to school. Now, I lived up over the Texas Hot, and it was about 12 blocks away. So I had physics in the morning, and my physics teacher, who was, was my football coach, started talking about what happened at Pearl Harbor. And he said, you know, most of you young boys are uh, 16, and you'll never go to see the war to go to it. 
because it'll be all over by the time you get to be of age to serve or to be part of it. But I, he said, I want you to know that a lot of young people are going over there. But he says, we'll finish that war off in three or four months. We'll surround the island. <laughs> we'll, it won't take very long to get it over with. And I felt a whole lot better that the war was going to be over. Because I was thinking, I, I'm not sure I want to go to war. So, seriously. But I remember that I, we got off to have lunch and so we could go home for, for dinner. And I was anxious because I wanted to get back to turn on my Philco radio to listen to President Roosevelt give his speech to Congress and declare war on Japan. And I ran home all the way, and I listened to the speech. I can remember that speech, the words, and Roosevelt finished, so help me God, when he finished his speech. And I was running late, and I ran all the way back to school. Yeah. A date that will live in infamy. Yes, yeah, infamy. Yeah. Yeah. But that's one of the great moments that stands still, I remember. To continue that, you graduated from Wellsville High School. Did you get drafted or did you uh, enlist? Well, I'll tell you a story. Okay? Sure. Part of the story is, yeah, I, I got drafted. To Greetings. You got a letter. Greetings. Yeah. Um, ties in a little bit. My age were two Greek boys in the same class. One was Charlie Raptus. He was my age. He was a partner in a Texas hot and my distant cousin, so we grew up together. The other was of a young Greek boy named Johnny Ninas. His dad had a restaurant in Bolivar. And we were both seniors in high school. And it so happened on this particular Sunday we had a Sons of Pericles meeting in Wellville. And we used to meet in the hall where we had Greek school behind the Marathon restaurant. It wasn't much of a building, it was just a hall, cold, damp, but it was, it served the purpose, okay. So afterwards, Johnny and Charlie and I were talking. And we were saying, well, you know, uh, we'll be graduating in a few months and we'll all be drafted. What's your plans? And what are we thinking? And um, so we start talking and Charlie said, well, he says, you know, I have a dream. I want to become a doctor. And so he says, if I get drafted and go in the Army, I don't get a choice of what branch to go in, what part. But if I volunteer for the Navy, I can choose to go in the Medical Corps and it might be a good background for me to get into a medical school when the war is over. So Charlie chose the Navy. Johnny Nino said, well, I'm choosing the Navy because I don't want to end up in the infantry where all the casualties are, and it's too dangerous. And besides, if I, uh, on a carrier or something, I got a bunk, I get a meal, I don't have to dig a foxhole, and that. 
So both of them chose to go in the Navy. I didn't do anything. And when I graduated, two weeks later, I got my draft call to welcome <laughs> Uncle Sam. So we all left for the service. And the sad part of it is it always come back to you, and I always think about that. What was meant to be in some place, God had a, a, a purpose. But the Johnny Ninas lost his life. He was on an aircraft carrier, on a kamikaze, kamikaze attack. Mr. John was killed. Charlie lost his life at Normandy preparing a week before because he was on a PT boat. The PT boat was hit by a German sub and Charlie he lost his life. So both of them lost their lives. And I ended up in the infantry. I came back and they didn't figure it out. You were in the infantry. Um, you were in a European theater. Yes. Uh, what, 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 what were you assigned to? What regiment were you assigned to? I was in the armored infantry. Okay. Okay. We drove on. Uh, so I was a PFC, just a rifleman. And, um, Miss Normandy, landed in uh, uh, France, went through France, went through Belgium, crossed the Rhine, went through Germany, and ended up in Salisbury, Austria, when the war was over. Do you remember when you got the word on June, I guess June 6th, 1945, that uh, VE Day had occurred, Victory in Europe Day. Do you remember where you were when you got the word the uh, European War was over? The European War or the Japan? Well, the, well, you were in Europe at the time when the war ended yeah. there. Yes. Did you, how did you get the word of that? Well, we knew it was coming close. And... Um, We were all anxious, but until it happened, it was it. So one day, I was sitting on a half track. We were in the border between Austria, um, and I was sitting on our half track, our vehicle. It was a nice sunny day, and somebody drove up in a Jeep, threw me a can of beer, <laughs> and said, the war's over. Oh, wow. And that was the, you know. But the real excitement came because when the war was over with Japan, because our division got reassigned uh. to, for the invasion. We were earmarked for the first, um, First divisions won the first to hit the coast, and when the the bomb went off. Where were you? Were you in the Pacific then, or just still? You hadn't been assigned yet. Well, we were assigned to be trained in California, uh, so I was assigned to California. But when we came back from Europe, I was given thirty days furlough, so I w went to Wellsville. And when I was in Wellsville, the bomb was dropped. And so for that celebration, I witnessed what was going down in my hometown. Explain that. What was the excitement like? 
Well, it was just all kinds of horns and noise. And cars were running. And you could hear them with the cars going from house to house. You knew that everybody was moving, going to parties. Uh, you know, it was just an extraordinary feeling of relief and just letting out so much. So much had happened. So much in the past. You saw so many of your friends not come back. Sacrifices being made all over. And the war, we never knew when it was going to end. Yeah, it was a, just a, one of those things that I don't know as I can ever express to what was going on. Speaking about difficulty in expressing, uh, I, I am the founder of the Robert Jackson Center in Jamestown, and Jackson prosecuted the, yes, the Nazis. Nuremberg. Nuremberg. And part of that evidence was what happened at concentration camps. And I understand you were at, you went to Dachau. Yes. Could you explain how that happened and your impressions? Well, what happened, being in the armed for the infantry, and uh, um, the armed infantry, one of the things was uh, to, um, to move fast. And so we were out front and it was, the war was starting to end. You could tell the German army had been pretty much defeated, but they hadn't surrendered at that time. time. And our mission was to um, liberate in a, uh, Munich, Germany. And as we were um, approaching Munich and we, we, we had resistance and um, I won't go into where the resistance came in a side story, but uh, when we finished our mission, in, and things had settled down, we were bivouacked outside of Dachau. And in those days, for, at least for me, I was just a 19-year-old kid then, um, I heard and read about things like concentration camps but it was still not really in my mind that concentration really existed because they were talked about. But, you know, there was a division between the news, what we got from American papers, and we really didn't know too much about what was happening. But anyway, we were outside of Dachau, and uh, on this particular day, we were right next to a railroad siding, and there became a train that was coming out of the camp, Dachau, the concentration camp. And it was a, what you call a, a freight car. And it was, and the doors were open in the freight car. And there were these strange looking people to me. And I couldn't under, understand who they were. They looked like people from an outer world. An, they came in these striped uniforms and they looked like skeletons. I could, you know, they didn't look like human beings. 
So my mind is, who are they? And then somebody who said, well, I don't know. We were just guys up front, <coughs> you know? And so why did the word come from? I think they, be, they came from the concentration camp. And then we started to put things together that were at Dachau. Now, some of the other fellows, our division was the first one. And there's a plaque at Dachau that says the 20th Armored Division liberated Dachau. And so some of the, us went in, but I didn't. I never got inside the gate. I just saw them coming out on the train. So, but I can tell you, it was a frightening experience, and uh, yes. And, um, As you reflect back, you're part of the greatest generation, John, and you know, Tom Brokaw, as I appropriately identified that, did us a great favor. Yeah. When, when, when you're children or grandchildren, normally grandchildren, ask you about World War II, what do you, what do you say, what do you say to them? Well, first of all, my grandchildren didn't ask too much about the war. So, you know, I tell them what stories I think is appropriate. You know, I don't go into a whole lot of details because I always, there was nothing, I never felt like most GIs, practically all we just did our job. And really, that's the way we, we wanted to be in there. Uh, I certainly didn't want to be 4F and I, so there was this great movement from our generation to get involved and get it over with, okay. And so, um, yeah. Uh, but now that I've gotten older, every once in a while I do tell a story or two. That, uh, but I'm very careful because sometimes I wonder, did that really happen? Am I exaggerating something? I don't want that to happen. So I'm very careful. However, one side story I do enjoy saying is that. Uh, my uh, grandchildren, some of them, uh, were going to Germany. Mm -hmm. And they didn't know much about World War II. They, they never asked too much. And, and every time I mentioned anything, they didn't seem to have too much. You know, okay, you went to war. You know, that's nice of you. And uh, we're proud of you. So I said, now, when you go to Germany, uh, I hope that you go towards Munich, and if you get a chance, visit Dachau, because we liberated Dachau, and I'm pretty proud of it. And the impression I got from the children uh, you know, they weren't listening too much. But when they got to Germany and they got to Munich, they decided, well, we'll go to visit Dachau like Dad wanted to. And when they got to Dachau, the, one of the first things they saw was a plaque that said 20th Armored Division was a the first division to liberate Dachau. And they said, wow, Dad was really here. <laughs> oh, that's great. What's the question I should be asking you, John? You've been utterly unbelievable. I appreciate your time. And what's the question you thought we should be, uh, we were going to ask today that we haven't? What's the question? What should, what should I have asked you? What have I missed? I guess the one thing that occurs to me is that the 
the sacrifices and united that this country was. We were one. And we were one nation. And the enthusiasm at the home front to change this from a, an economy based on material things to an e wartime economy and start building tanks and airplanes and the women going to work in the factory and all of that. But combined with that is the, the, not the excitement, the drive that the young people had that I have to go, but I want to be part of this. And tied to that is that when I visit Normandy, and I look over those monuments, the Star David, the crosses, beautiful marble, and this, the coast, and what happened at Normandy, what I sense and I look at is, my God, most of these people are just young men that are buried here, 18, 19, what? It's just amazing. That's what stays in my mind. You are so articulate. Um, can I switch gears for another second, John? Just What's another, that? another second. Uh, I drove into Cowdersport, Cowdersport, Pennsylvania. And I drove by the Elliott Ness Museum. Yeah. And I stopped and had lunch at the Hotel Crittenden. Okay. And I'm doing my research. On, not on you, but I'm doing my research on Elliott Ness. And I'm reading the book by Paul Heimel. Paul Heimel was a player of yours in Little League. Correct. And Paul said you With were the... My son. You're I got to tell you a story about my sons, too. Go ahead. Okay. Well, Paul, I want to get this out for the camera because Paul wanted me to say this, that you were the best baseball manager he ever had. You were a, stat, you were a strategist. You gave, ter you gave signals and signs that nobody else was giving at Little League. But I, th I think that's an exaggeration. Well, go ahead. Let, let me, I'll go with it. So, uh, in, but reading Paul's book, he, he mentions the fact that Elliot Ness... When he was here in 56 and 57, his path crossed with yours. What was he like? He was a wonderful, modest, jolly person. Smile, very humble, and... Uh, Very, very smart, bright mind, and uh, what I when I was first introduced to him, there was a guy that was promoting this enterprise was uh, Elliot Ness. That they brought in Elliot Ness to lead the president. And he kept, every time I'd have coffee with him or, and have breakfast with him, Joe, with his name, would tell me wh what he did with the Chicago and Al Capone and all that. And, and uh, uh, but Elliot Ness would never talk about it and never say much about it. Uh, anything like that yeah. and what I did get out of Elliot was that he was
was a very, very honest man. And in his role of trying to promote this endeavor, I found him very hard because it wasn't his, his thing to, to be bragging about this company and promote it. He left it, and you didn't get too much out of it. Yeah. But I will tell you one story that, that, that I remember. When I met with Elliot, I would sit down, and the first time, you know, the reason that I, Joe said, John, I want you to meet Mr. Elliot Ness. And they were promoting this enterprise uh, in uh, Cottesport, providing some jobs, and they needed uh, money, resources to raise it for the company. And um, I was very skeptical. So I sat down with Elliot this first time, and and um, we got pretty friendly, and they kept telling me about it and the company and everything, and I'd ask some questions, and nothing came out of it. Then the second or third time, then Elliot Ness got to be pretty good friends, but he still. I still hadn't bought anything or made any investment. He was getting frustrated with me, <laughs> I think. And then, but during the discussions, Elliot would say, um, you know, uh, I and this Oscar Fraley, who was a sports writer out of Cleveland, have been meeting up at the Crittenden Hotel uh, to write this book. And then he said they finished it. And uh, I said, wow, wow, that's something, writing a book. Yeah, he said, yeah. He says, and uh, um, we have some possibilities of uh, they might do a TV show on it. And I thought to myself, well, you know, I'm not, it's, I just passed it off. I, <laughs> you know, so one day I was having coffee with Elliot and he said, uh, you know, there's a lot of interest from, uh, I think we're going to be able to get a, a TV contract. I still passed it off. I didn't pay much attention. And one morning, Elliot said that we signed a contract. And he was ecstatic. And then a few weeks later, he died of a heart attack. So he never got to see anything of it. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, a few years later, <coughs> Desi Lou Productions produces The Untouchables. And you watch it on TV. What did you think? You, you knew the guy. What did I think? Yeah. There's Robert Stack playing Elliot Ness. Well, at first, I was probably patting myself on the shoulder and saying, I knew that guy, <laughs> and taking credit for being a friend of his, baloney. Okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, what I thought was, it didn't sound like Elliot Ness. He was such a gentle person. There's no way he could throw somebody off the rope. <laughs> so I thought, I think were a bit exaggerated, but they were making a movie. But I also know that he risked his life many times to do what he did. He was no, he, he was, he was a brave man. Yeah. And what I was watching, I was really proud to have known him and then to make a movie, a TV show. 
Yeah, and he was in Cottesport. He made us all proud. We shouldn't take no credit, but we st still take credit. So, rightfully so. I'm going to, one last comment or question, because you were going to start to tell a baseball story about your son. So I want you to tell that story. What's that? You were going to tell a story about Paul Heimel oh, and your you son. Oh, you want to hear that one? Yeah. Okay, all right. Well, I was coaching the team. And on my team with my three sons, Mike, Tim, and James. And on the team was a young lad by the name of Chris Pommetier. And I was working at the airport heater in Wellsville running the theater, of course, and the cable systems. And sitting next to me was an engineer by the name of Bemis Pommetier. His first name was Bemis. And evidently, when we were having practice or during the game, I would I accidentally, I'm forgetful, call Chris Bemis. And I'd say, pick up the bat, Bemis, uh, hit a few or whatever, you know. And so one night at dinner, my three sons ganged up on me and said, Dad, you got to stop calling Chris Bemis. <laughs> he says, that's a terrible name. And, you know, we're embarrassed that you're calling that name and you got to stop calling. That's not very nice. And they were really pretty strong about it, but, you know, they really meant it. So I said, well, okay, I'll be careful. I didn't realize that this, I was doing that. As a, and and uh, I won't, uh, I'll be very very uh, aware of that from now on. So about 20 years later, on the street in Cottesport, I bumped into Chris Palmatier. And Chris was glad to see me and we were shaking hands and said, uh, what a wonderful time he, memories he had playing baseball on the team and I'd be in his coach and he appreciated that uh, I was his coach and everything. And then out of a clear sky, he said to me, by the way, Mr. Riggis, you know what we named my oldest son? I said, I have no idea what you named your oldest son. Well, we named him Bemis. We <laughs> loved that day. <laughs> Father knows best. Father knows best. Okay. Well, you're great. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. Fantastic. This is this is unbelievable. What's unbelievable? Your this interview was unbelievable. Oh. Okay. You were terrific. Terrific. Oh. But I'm going to come back and we're going to talk Sabers. Well, I wish you would. We will get serious. I'd love to talk <laughs> Sabers. Thank you. A lot of history. I got to tell you that story about Satin. Okay. Sa you want to hear that one? Sure. Now? Yeah. You got that. Guys doing okay? Yeah. Okay. Sure. We're on a roll. I, I, I can stay here all day. Well, I don't remember. Jim Kelly was a sports writer, and he covered this Sabres. Sure, right. Yeah, beard. And Satin, Satan, Sat. Satan. 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 Yeah. Satan, yeah. Satan was having a big year, but he was... He reached a slump, and he wasn't scoring. So I was in a locker room before the game, and I wish we were in everybody luck. And, and just before they were going on the ice, Miroslav said to me, he says, Mr. Rigas, would you do me a favor? 
And I says, well, if I can, I sure will. He says, well, he says, look, he says, things haven't been going too well. Uh, would you uh, rub my hockey stick for good luck? And I said, you think it'll make a difference? He says, I'd appreciate it. If you would do that, it might help me. So I rubbed his stick. So he went out there and he scored a couple goals, had a big game, and after the game, all the reporters were around him and, and they were interviewing him and, and he started telling the story about he, that he owes this to John Riggis because he rubbed my hockey stick. So the next day, Jim Kelly, the sports writer, wrote a story. <laughs> said, if, if you are running into a streak of bad luck, he said, he told a story about, so, about me rubbing a stick and sat and he wrote, but he said, now John, do me a favor, please run, Rub my wallet. <laughs> That's a great story. <laughs> That's a great story. Well, I'm sure there's more of them, and I'm coming back, John. I, I want you to know that. We're going to come back and talk sports. Good. Good. We'll talk sports. What, uh, where do you live? I live in Jamestown. So I'm what do you do? I'm an attorney in Jamestown. You're what? I'm an attorney. You are? Yeah, I'm an attorney in Jamestown, and our firm... Uh, for a long time had as uh, Bob Suedos. Oh, yeah. Bob was in our firm. So I got a lot of stories from well, Bob. That's the same firm as Bob? Well, Bob was in his own firm. Cohen and Suedos was the firm name. And then they uh, uh, they quit. They terminated. Yes. And then Bob came with my firm, Phillips Lytle. So I got to know Bob very well at the end. Yeah, Bob... Uh yeah, he was a personality, man. Oh, yeah, you know. I'd sit next to him. He'd, yeah. he'd grumble at the referees, and, but he knew his hockey, and he took an awful lot of pride in it. The Sabres and uh, the, the Knoxes and all that. But that's another story. Someday if we talk with you, you know, Bob, I got uh, some great stories on Bob. Yeah, well, he had a young associate... Their name Nellie Drew. Young, I don't know if you knew her. Uh, she was a, a now the head of sports uh, at the Buffalo Law School, and we just had her, Nellie Drew, uh, at the Jackson Center. Oh yeah. And she was involved in getting Alexander Mogilny out of Russia and all of those crazy stories. So we'll talk. We'll talk. We'll talk Sabers. Well, uh, where'd you go to law school? I went to Dickinson Law School down in Carlisle, oh, Pennsylvania. Yeah. We'd have a lot of people from. We had a couple from. Kahili went to Dickinson. Who else? Quite a few of the lawyers. Now John Duvall did, didn't he? What's that? Didn't John Duvall go there? John Duvall. I, he might have gone to. Yeah, sure. I think. But, so that. Uh, okay. I just happened to go to Dickinson. Yeah. I went from. I went to Allegheny College. And then I went to Dickinson from there. So it was oh, sort you of graduated a, from Meadville and uh, yeah. uh, Allegheny. Yeah, so I was a Pennsylvania guy, really. Where'd you grow up? In Jamestown, but oh. my family, uh, prince, principally in the Warren County, Sheffield, Ludlow, sure, all of that. Ludlow, Austin. <laughs> all my fact, Austin, Pennsylvania. Oh yeah, really? That's amazing. Yeah, well, we still play Sheffield. So, a whole lot of things going on. I'm going to get a picture, John, with you sitting there with Tim and Mike. Mike, are they still here? Yeah. Okay, let's get a picture here. Of you guys. So you think this interview went okay? Yeah. Huh? How about you, Todd? It went great. Really well. What's that? I haven't been doing a lot of interviews, but this is right there at the top. Is it? <laughs> did, did we lose your brother, Mike? Uh, Tim, I think did, he's upstairs. Let me see what he's upstairs. Here. Okay. You were terrific. You gave great insight as to the early church, 
and great insight as to the, some of the pastors and, and the reaction of the new church and how things work. Most people don't understand. I, I'm, not, I'm not Greek. I'm not Greek Orthodox. So I ask the dumb questions just to how to understand how you have really one church, physical church in Jamestown, and it's got a big geography and the relationship you have with the Episcopal churches. It, it, likewise in Jamestown with the yeah. St. Luke's. Yeah. You know, and so that's all interesting. Mm -hmm. All interesting. So as part of their documentary, to you got to instruct us to where they're coming from, the history. And you're it. You're the history. Well, um, I was thinking about, uh, I was going to, um, I told this, I was honored at a dinner in, um, in the, the cable industry, that's another story, we were at the Waldorf Astoria, and uh, it was a, a fundraiser for minorities, and it was a pretty prestigious black tie affair, and, and I was very apprehensive, you know, what would I say? Uh, uh, because they were honoring me that particular dinner. Yeah. And uh, I did say that, you know, um, my entry is, uh, my story was that, you know, I said when I was growing up and I was a little apprehensive, not apprehensive, a little ashamed that I was a, a Greek immigrant because the Greek priest is an example. He'd have a beard. All the pastors and, and the priests in the Catholic Church, or the, they didn't have beards. Only the Greek Orthodox had a beard. I noticed the, the Catholic Church, when they crossed themselves, went one side, we crossed ourselves starting on the other side. It was different, but I noticed we were different again. And I noticed that when I went into some of the, my friends' homes, they had carpets that were plain, beautiful, shaded colors, you know, blue or white or whatever. But when they came to my house, they had these funny looking carpets with all kinds of things on it. And nobody else did. And I thought, oh, this is embarrassing. And then they'd have this guy from Syria that was selling these carpets, Oriental carpets, and I thought, oh my, you know, but that's all we had in our house was Oriental carpets. Now we got a Greek priest that's got a beard, crossing himself on the wrong side, <laughs> got these funny carpets, and then when my friends came to the house and mom would say, have something to eat, they'd give them, she'd give them some feta cheese, and they'd spit it out. And feta cheese was unheard of, and I'm eating feta cheese like it was going out of the world. And uh, so all those things made me very, uh, I was different. And then one day, I was in third grade. I made a mistake during St. Patrick's Day to wear something orange on me. Oh, gosh. <laughs> That's a mistake. <laughs> yeah. That's a mistake. So I ended up, I went to the playground, and all of a sudden, 
three of those bully guys came along and started shoving me around and pushing me, you know, blah, blah, blah. I didn't even know what they were talking about. So my point is, okay, they were unpopular, unheard of in those days, but today, or oh, in the clubs are in, feta cheese is in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's okay. <laughs> we're on top of the world. Greeks are on top of the world, no question. Your brother here? She just, he's right nearby, he's just on the phone. All right. Yeah. So we're going to get a photo of the board. Nice here. to see you all. Nice to see you. You guys have something to make tonight, don't you? Don't you have to get back to something? We do have to get going. Yeah. What time is it? I know what I'm going to do, because I'm going separately. Right. I'm inspired. I'm going through Wellsville to get a hot dog. Ah, I That's what my, I, I wasn't, I didn't have that plan, but now I am. I'm a hot dog guy anyway. If you're a baseball fan, John, like you and me, you got to be a hot dog guy, you know? Oh, I'm a real baseball fan. That's that's still my number one sport, no question about it. Yeah. I saw you pitched, you threw out the first pitch just a couple of years ago down in the Wellsville Nitros. Yeah, the Nitros, Nitros yeah. yeah. Well, I started the Nitros a yeah. little ago. But I remember... Uh, I was kind of funny. In baseball, when I was growing up, it was really the, the pastime, no question about it. It's all changed now. But um, my first Major League Baseball was in 1939. I was in New York City with my godfather, and I was a big New York Giants fan before they moved, of course. And my hero was Carl Hubble and Mel Ott and so on. And we went to Ebbets Field for the first game. But the thing is that what I laugh about is in baseball, because baseball had all kinds of names. And on the mound, pitching for the Brooklyn Dodgers, was a pitcher by the name of Van Lingo Mungo. Oh my God. Isn't that a great name, Van Lingo Mungo? Okay. And on first base for the Giants was Zeke Bananas Banura. <laughs> I thought, that's two great names that always, I thought, my first baseball games the name stood out. Well, here's what here's our job, John. I'm going to give it to your sons because I bet here, I oh, bet yeah. here in this collection is the song on Van Lingo Mungo. It's a very special song, just on names, but that's the title of it, Van Lingo Mungo. So I believe in this. You'll, you'll find it. Probably you'll find. It. If I can't find it there, I'll find it on YouTube. Absolutely, probably. absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> probably better luck. Than, uh, Come on, Tim. Mike, let's have well. a picture here. Photo here. Photo here. Uh, okay. Yes. How are you going to use this? Right, we're going to, this is Facebook, YouTube, okay. eBay. I don't know. All right. Well, I know these are, these are your baseball guys. You know, really, that's a great story, John. These guys ganging up on you like that. Wow. You know, really. Don't you feel yeah. bad? He kind no, of deserves not really. it. Now. Okay. You think he took a liberties with that story, did he? Yeah. 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 Well, you no, were great. That this is true. That about. People say, well, he must have trouble with Thank names. Thank you so ages. much. Well, he had trouble when he was 35. So, What's that? Remembering names, right? Oh, yeah. Getting names wrong. Right. Yeah. Oh, trust me. Bemis? Bemis, yeah. That was a great story. Well, Todd, how's business? <laughs> well, I'm not in the restaurant business right now. Uh, I'm, come here. <laughs> yeah, come on so you can hear you better. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm busy driving our three kids to three different schools. Oh, you are? So every day I'm the putting in bus, st man. about 60 miles on the car, just wow. delivering kids and picking them up. Are they pretty active in sports, too? How'd you two yep. meet? Uh, we met in, in Warren at my one restaurant. In where? Warren. Warren. Yeah. How, how close are we to Elkland, Pennsylvania? Uh, it's about 40 minutes. About 40 yeah. minutes? That's yeah, where my... 35 uh, miles or 40 miles. That's where my grandparents 
uh, okay. lived, yeah. Mm-hmm. So right on Route 50, right on Route si- or, uh, 49, 49. Yeah. Right in front of mm-hmm. our house there. So Take I a left and drove through this town a lot yeah. when yeah. I was young. But, uh, That's a nice little town. It had yeah. a big tannery, right? It had, yeah. Yes. yeah. Uh, my grandfather was the pharmacist, and uh, my grandmother was uh, a doctor, so they had a nice little... Uh, yeah, nice little racket right. going on. Yeah, right. <laughs> drugs off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now the pharmacy there is owned by someone in Cowdersport, McCannon Brothers. I mean, they have a What's his first? Here. What's his first name? Greg. Huh? Greg. Greg. Rick. Greg. 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 Do you remember um, the Texas hot under the? Uh, yeah, Van Van Go- Vans. Van. Well, it was Van before it was um, Chris's place. Was it? It was owned by the Palace family, oh, and okay. the well, the oldest son, Palace, married my sister, Catherine. Oh, really? He's a doctor. Let me give you my Let card, first of all, sir. Okay, thank you. Yeah. You guys could talk for a year. Oh my goodness. Oh, we, we, we just got started. Right. Yeah. We just got He's started. He's just warming up. Ah. We won't be able to shut him off tonight. But they have so much yeah. in common, it's uncanny. I didn't know that about so Bob Suedo. Here, you want me to turn this off? No, 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 no. Is that okay. Gilney? Yeah, the Bob Suedo's piece, we could go forever. I got. I will tell you one story. Everybody's got to go. One, one quick story. I'm in, I'm in Russia. I'm in Russia as part of the Jackson Center in Nuremberg, because the Russians were part of that, and they were celebrating. And I'm in a van. I'm in a van going to where we're going to have this commemoration of the... 70th anniversary of the Nuremberg trial and I've got an interpreter with me, a young college guy.